Okay, so I will be talking about what the title suggests, as Patnavi said, that uh, if or if not, a standard cosmology can accommodate any variation of fundamental couplings. But having said that, uh, this discussion we will embark upon altogether is not really, uh, we don't have a target to solve big things in gravity. We want to just serve our curiosity, uh, whether or not it can happen. Okay, we will not solve the first uh, dark energy problem or variation of fundamental couplings for that matter. It is a matter of simple curiosity. So, and curiosity should always be. This is not working. It should work. Something is here. I mean, every time you scroll, you can. So maybe just yeah, clicking yeah. on it. Oh, right. So, so as I as I personally believe that curiosity should always be chased, and has and ha, as mankind has taught us time and again. So I will start by quoting Cicero, who was actually a politician uh, in ancient Roman culture, and he basically said that you can serve curiosity by choosing any simple action. Which has a sort of a resonance in gravity because in gravity everything starts to connect. Okay, so uh, this will be the publications uh, from where I have picked up bits and pieces. Uh, the main work has been done by Bekenstein, and after that, uh, Barrow with his collaborators, and uh, recently by me. Okay, so before we go into the very actual variations, let me just what standard cosmology means and which part of standard cosmology we are going to talk about. So it is the uh, universe, specifically in the late time era, that is the present era in which we are now present. So the founding rules are this, uh, the dynamics of the universe is described by the Einstein equation. So standard GR or its modification of GR, they are valid. And an appropriate form of energy moment of tensor 
which is connected to the composition of the universe. So you will write some equation. Left hand side is your curvature or the right hand side is just whatever matter is there in your universe, known or unknown. And uh, the cosmological principle always holds good, which states that in macroscopic scales, the universe can be seen as homogeneous and asymptotic, which has many a uh, confirmation from astronomical observations, for instance, the CMD. And the mathematical aspect is governed by this Friedman Robertson Walker metric, which governs the geometry part of your cosmology of gravity. So, this AT is the, your scale factor and which governs all important things we are concerned about. And this K is a curvature parameter. Uh, K equal to zero suggests that we are working in a specially flat space. K equal to one and minus one suggests a closed universe and open universe. So we will be considering k equal to zero case. Okay. What we further assume is that uh, throughout normal cosmology, that the universe behaves like a perfect fluid, and which is expressed in this manner, where rho and p these are energy density and the pressure of that fluid. And uh, you actually express this energy momentum tensor and the your geometrical components in a co-moving reference frame which means that any body is at rest with the fluid or the universe in this case. So the spatial components of the velocity matrix. So essentially u mu is given by this minus one zero zero zero. So that normal, the normalization of the four velocity is served and you can write this energy momentum tensor in diagonal. So basically your mathematics gets simpler. And these are the cosmological equations. This is the first Friedman equation. This is the second Friedman equation. And you can also write it in terms of Hubble parameter, which is h equal to a dot by a. But the most important equation is perhaps the acceleration <laughs> equation, which you can write by manipulating these two equations. So basically, it suggests you that if your universe is accelerated uh, such that a double dot is greater than zero, you must have a big unexplained negative pressure to explain it, since rho cannot be negative. So this is what everyone envisages as a dark energy or whatever it is. But this is what it is. And also the fluid components uh, satisfy among themselves the continuity equation, which is equivalent to the origin. So having established this, uh, let us move forward. So what, what are the usual components to describe such a large negative pressure? And what are the potentials? So the very the most common one is the cosmological constant, which is a constant energy density correction. But after many decades of uh, conceiving the idea, there is no fully acceptable mechanism for generating such a small constant. And one step generalization of the cosmological constant is the quintessence, which is a self-interacting scalar field, which produces a time evolving energy density correction. But in present day, this is highly discovered so-called fifth force experiments that essentially produces constraints on the interaction between quintessence and ordinary matter. So essentially, in a nutshell, it says that if you have a scalar field of this type, it should have some sort of an interaction with ordinary matter in order to avoid detection. Uh, because in ordinary life, we cannot see scalar fields. And from that comes the scalar fields with uh, spinning mechanism. There are many examples of that. The scalar field where the scalar field avoids being detected by solar system experiments by decoupling in region of higher density due to spinning mechanism. By region of higher density, I mean essentially around that. And finally, the last but not the least, scalar tensor theories of gravity, which is essentially very old theories, but they are tried to be regulated time and again so from different perspectives, different motivations. And they introduce geometric scalar field, but more on that later. So, what is the basic itinerary? If you want to uh, construct a unit theory of gravity, a standard theory of gravity, first you set up the field equation. You write the field equation, be it simple or complicated, whatever it is. Second, you construct a cosmological dynamics that satisfies your basic cosmological force. Now, there is a catch. You can either exactly solve the field equation if you are able, but uh, more often than not, people are unable. So, basically, what people do is that they use a plethora of observational data or, or some sort of well-motivated answers and they essentially reverse engineer the structure of the modified theory. 
And finally, with the first two steps, you solve for the structural level. This is the simple. So the modifications we are going to consider in this discussion, they have certain motivations. The first motivation comes from uh, Dirac, which who was basically the forefather of this kind of predictions. That uh, he basically said that large or small, whatever the dimensionless universal constants, they cannot be pure mathematical numbers. It is artificial to say that, and it must they must not occur in the basic laws of physics. They should rather be considered as variable parameters characterizing the different state of the universe. So the manner universe is evolving, they have some sort of a correlation with this couplings. We should rather say not constants. And also in string and n theories and other theories of grand unification, uh, the idea exists that the fundamental couplings are constants, but actually in higher dimension. What, what we see that um Effective three plus one dimensional representations, which can show variation in the And uh, I should mention various observational evidences in this regard. The most important one being the relativistic transitions in molecular absorption lines of different quasar spectras. And we will be using some data sets of quasar absorption spectra in this discussion. And finally, the most important reason to do any such thing is curiosity. So what if we replace these couplings, one or two or more of these fundamental couplings as scalar fields? What difference it might make? So these are the basic motivations. As it happens, there is already a famous theory of gravity where the variation of one fundamental coupling is promoted, which is called the branch Dicke theory. So it was conceived, as you can see, more than 50 years back. And the basic motivation of writing a branch decay theory was to incorporate the Marx principle in here. Now, the Marx principle is a philosophical principle. It says that in any local motion in a physical frame of reference must be somehow connected to the large scale matter distribution of it. So basically, it means that your gravitational, the strength of your gravitational interaction can act depending on time and space. So this can be done by writing the gravitational coupling in your einstein hilbert action and making it a scalar field, a geometric scalar field, such that the Newtonian coupling acts depending on that scalar field. And uh, one also um, puts in by hand a branch decay coupling parameter omega, which dictates the results of the theory in weak field approximation. But uh, this parameter actually leads to the failure of the standard theory. Because from observations, one finds rigid constants on this omega. And there are also lack of viable cosmological solutions for all. So by all mailbox, I mean it is generally understood that our universe, after the Big Bang, has went through a series of acceleration and deceleration. First being the early inflation, which is the era of accelerator expansion. After that, it's a matter dominated above of deceleration. And finally, the late time acceleration. So standard branch decay theory actually fails to be. Uh, consistent cosmological function from all the epochs. Okay, so one has time and again tried to rejuvenate the theory by considering extensions, for instance, by taking this parameter itself to be a function of scalar field, the branch decay field itself, considering more than one scalar fields, but these are all hand-picked motivations. Uh, motivations to do some toy model. So there actually exists uh, more fundamental motivations from which we can write a branch decay field type. And the main motivation is that despite the huge significance of the Higgs potential in standard model of electroweak interactions, the origin of the Higgs potential structure is not known. Higgs potential has a very interesting structure, some constant plus a coupling into phi square plus another coupling into phi to the power three. This is the interactive structure. But it has no additional, you cannot actually derive. So here we show that the structure can be derived from a generalized branch only if you give two interacting scalar fields, one is the branch decay field, and another field which interacts to gravity derivatively and non derivatively I will explain what it means uh, when I write the mathematical equations. And as a bonus, it can be shown that this Higgs potential, which is derived from this theory as a uh, feedback mechanism, it allows a mildly time evolving vacuum expectation value, which indicates a possible time variation of proton to electron mass ratio, masses of fundamental particles 
so in turn in turn uh, prevention of fundamental problems is there penetration yes it's random random that's why uh, i mean this nanan energy to and this nanan energy to both of them one time <laughs> Okay, so in a nutshell, there is two scalar fields in this theory. As you can see, this is the action of the theory. The first term is the pure branch decay term, where R is the Ricci curvature scalar, psi is the branch decay scalar field, which is of canonical dimension to uh, canonical dimension and in uh, reduced Planck mass unit or natural units. You don't need to think about much about that at this moment. And this is the branch decay parameter and the kinetic term of the branch decay scalar field. So what we do is that we put in the rest of the terms by hand at this moment, but at the end of the calculation, the motivation should be there. So this is the additional scalar field phi. It does a plethora of things. First, it interacts with curvature in this manner. It interacts with psi in this manner. It has its own kinetic contribution. It interacts with gravity in a tensorial manner as well through this term S mu nu, where S mu nu is defined in this manner. Which is almost similar to Einstein tensor, but not quite because the zeta parameter and theta they are not equal. We have chosen it not to be equal, and it has a self interaction. So we do not uh, put in any form of the self interaction by hand at this moment. Right. So for the special case, theta equal to uh, uh, zeta, this s mu is proportional to g mu nu, but we work with theta not equal. Right, so xi and eta are dimensionless, which are the these parameters of interaction. And xi stands for the non-minimal coupling of the field phi with which is scalar, and eta signifies the coupling between the two scalar fields, xi and phi. Now the intention is to show that this scalar potential, which we have left unspecified, that will take some structure. We are not specifying at this moment. Once we impose the appropriate one. So these are the field equations, tensorial field equations. And this is the Friedman Robertson Walker equations. Once you put in these answers for specially flat FRW cosmology. And uh, more importantly, we have neglected any matter contribution in this theory so far because we want to see how the scalar fields do on their own. So these are the three independent field equations we need to solve. Okay, so these are the solution. First, let us try. So this is actually a, a hint of a power law solution where you can write the scale factor as some t to the power t or t to the power n, that sort of thing. And if you calculate the Hubble from that, it will give you t by t. So t is greater than zero because we need to fit funding. And phi t and psi, we have also chosen to be power law. And uh, these power law solutions are actually very simple solutions. They are not complete, but can be treated as asymptotic cases of more general cases of cosmic, cosmic evolution. And P, alpha, and gamma are dimensionless parameters. And phi 1 and psi 1 are the values of scalar fields at some reference time. Whenever you need it, you can use that reference. And this gamma parameter is very important because it controls the running of Newtonian gravitational power because it has, is connected to the branch to this one. OK, so what we do is very simple a very simple mathematical exercise. We put in these answers. In the field equation. The first field equation gives you an expression of the scalar, scalar potential, which is uh, not very good, but it will get better. And you insert the answer in the second field equation and integrate it, and you find an alternative form of the potential. So you have basically two forms of the potential which needs to be somehow connected with one another for components. You have the third field equation still, which does not have any contribution from the potential, which essentially gives you a pinpointed value of alpha for consistency, alpha equal to minus one. From this relation, it is very straightforward to see. Now we put all this in the two expression of the potential and compare. Equation 20 and 21. As you can see that these two equations are almost equal, but there are two powers of gamma, uh, of t. One is t to the power gamma minus two, Okay. 
Okay, so we essentially have two powers of gamma, uh, time. One is gamma minus two and one is minus four. And these are constant coefficients with lots of parameters. So we have essentially two options. One, t to the power gamma minus two and t to the power minus, out of my, uh, minus four are of the same power. That is gamma equal to minus two, which is one possible solution. But this is problematic because it will lead to the fact that psi, the branch decay scalar field is proportional to t to the power minus two. And since the Newtonian coupling is inversely proportional to that, the Newtonian coupling will run out as, as a function of time in quadratic order. So that is not acceptable. And uh, to refer observational evidences and discussions, I have put in these references here, where people have actually worked out that for this kind of solution in branch decay theory, the gamma parameter should be less than 10 to the minus 3. So this is not physical. So you are left with only one. So gamma minus 2 and minus 4 are two independent power, so their coefficients should be. So essentially, this gives you two equations, and you solve them and find the expression of the so basically, it throws you back the structure of the Higgs potential. But the point is, the coefficient of this phi square has a very mild time value. As you recall from these evidences, if not our calculations, gamma is less than or equal to 10 to the power minus 3. Let it be 10 to the power minus 3. So basically, there is a very mild time evolution of this coefficient of phi square. And this is constant. So it's a phi phi is about 4. So you have two options. You can treat gamma to be almost zero, and yeah. okay, yes. gamma to be zero, and take this coefficient as a constant and treat it as standard Higgs-like potential, or you can treat this time variation as you have two basically options. Right. So QVD is that the Higgs structure of the same interaction comes from a simple consistency analysis. And this structure can only be shaped if and only if the non-minimal derivative coupling and the cross interaction terms remain. The two arbitrary interaction terms of phi are introduced by hand at the very end. So these are the two QEDs. So from this point onwards, let us talk about an, a little bit extension of this thing. Why extension? Because we have worked with power law cosmology. So it actually explains the different era of cosmological expansion quite well, but it cannot explain the transition from one epoch to another. For the transition, you need a transition of the deceleration parameter. It should, uh, whenever you are uh, describing acceleration, the deceleration parameter is supposed to be negative. And from transition from decelerated era of expansion to an accelerated era of expansion, it requires the deceleration to cross the zero at some point. That is not possible with the power of cosmological model. So there should be a more generalized cosmological model in our hand to actually judge, judge the capacity of the theory. So to do that, we at this point, we choose V phi as a Higgs potential at the outset with this structure. Actually, we haven't kept alpha to be constant yet, just waiting for the sake of brevity, but more on that later. We do not specify any form of this cross interaction potential. In earlier cases, it was phi square psi. Now we have uh, kept it just as an interval. Okay, and what we will do now is a, a simple methodology which is called a parametric reconstruction. Uh, cosmology through reconstruction is already quite a popular avenue to figure out a more consistent model of cosmology among the spectrum of chances. And uh, we use the state finder parameter, which was popular, popularized by Shiny et al. and uh, Ujjani Alam. And, uh, I should mention that A is equal to zero for standard lambda city of model. And we have taken this chance to adjust that as well. We have taken S not equal to zero and worked out the uh, reconstruction to see if it is zero or not. Okay, so these are the standard definitions once more. This is Hubble. This is the deceleration parameter. And this is the jar parameter. 
and this is the state finder parameter. This is the this is our main interest here. Uh, we introduce the cosmic redshift as one plus z equal to x, and have written the derivatives with respect to s as h prime. So basically, then s the definition of s essentially gives you this equation twenty nine, and if you assume s to be some parameter delta minus two third, so delta minus two third has no additional significance. That just for the sake of mathematical manipulation, you can choose it anyway. It essentially gives you a differential and a second order nonlinear differential equation. You can actually solve it for an analytical expression of Hubble as a function of redshift. So, before going into a little bit about data analysis, we can already say that analytically, for a real evolution of Hubble, this power must be real so that uh, the thing in the parenthesis should be greater than zero so that we can write this constant on this parameter. Okay, for the data analysis, we have actually used three different data sets and we work with the confidence contour comparison with best fit values in parameters. This, I'm not spending much time on data analysis uh, because I intend to talk about results more. So this, these are the estimations or the estimations that uh, the Hubble is in the region of 0 0.7, this is actually dimension this Hubble, scaled by 100 kilometer per megaparsec per second. So whenever you think about the actual Hubble parameter, you multiply that. And this parameter C1 and delta are um, estimated here. And as you can see, interestingly, that the state finder parameter is delta minus two third. So if you input the value of delta from here into the definition, you can find that state finder equal to zero is a good option, which is the standard lambda CDM. But a little bit of fluctuation is also allowed which allows the state finder to be within 0 0.011 and minus 0 0.011. Okay, and to compare, for, further compare this uh, cosmological setup with observational data, we plot the Hubble as a function of redshift along with the type one and supernova data and plot the deceleration and jerk with the red, as a function of redshift along with the error estimation regions. So as you can see that this is quite a consistent cosmology as, as you can see that Hubble evolution matches well with the data. And also the deceleration parameter is negative at the current epoch close to minus 0 0.6, which is uh, around somewhere around the actual estimate, I believe. And before Z equal to one, it changes sign from a positive region into a negative region, which indicates that the universe has transferred itself from a decelerated past to an accelerated present somewhere the recent past. Okay, so now having established this kind of cosmological dynamics, we also have a, an exact expression of Hubble. All we need to do is to solve the structure of the So this is the, actually the equations of the modified theory with you uh, this cross interaction potential unspecified. So this is option one where you uh, have not taken M0 to be a function of coordinates. You have taken the standard Higgs potential and option two is of more importance to us where you have taken this M to be a function of time, which was calculated from the earlier feedback. And lambda is dimensionless and you can calculate the Higgs vacuum expectation value mu from this expression and which is uh, given by this root over minus two M2 by lambda. And essentially you can express this MT as a function of redshift as well by writing M0 UZ. So U0 is dimensionless and all the dimensions of this vacuum expectation value is uh, contained within this parameter. Okay, so now before going into further calculations, let me discuss a little bit about importance of this variation of Higgs vacuum expectation value because it carries within itself a notion of varying proton to electron mass ratio. So I will not discuss it in length here because it is not a discussion on standard models or that kind of thing. Just, just as a take home note, uh, notion of varying proton to electron mass ratio is a dimensionless ratio that quantifies strength of strong and emission state of interaction. And for any electron or quark, if you assume the Yukawa coupling to be a constant lambda, then one can show that their mass is proportional to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. So essentially, if your Higgs vacuum expectation value varies with cosmic time or redshift, then this mass is supposed to vary as well. 
but not for all the particles because the proton mass has an negligible effect from this. So you have electron mass varying very slightly. Proton mass not really. So your proton to electron mass ratio, which is a fundamental coupling, that is supposed to show some benefit, a cosmic benefit. And physically, it has already been predicted by actually these people, the most recent being Xavier Kalman, that cosmologically Higgs vacuum expectation value actually sees some variation if you take into account the possibilities during an era of electroweak phase transition, which coincides somewhere around the disseminated power expansion, which I'm not really sure. Okay, so what we do is basically we take observational bound on this proton to electron mass ratio from various analysis and observational analysis, which is like this uh, of the order of 10 to the power minus 16 per year, which seems very small, but not quite if you write in terms of Hubble, which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 6. And this is a table which we have used to adjudge our calculations with respect to these observations. These are the quasars from which some spectra is taken. And uh, actually cesium atomic spectra, I believe. And for different red shifts, the delta mu by mu measurements are written. So what we have done is that we have first written this V phi as a function of phi and with the coefficient of phi square to the m varying with time. And mt varies as m0 into uz, we have put an answers of uz, which matches with this observation. And this is one possible answer. We are not claiming it to be the only possible functional form, but it go, as you can see, it goes very well with observation. And uh, if you analyze this uh, prediction with your uh, observational points, you can also estimate the different parameter values, u1, u2, u3, u4, in this manner. And now we throw everything back at our modified field, whatever we propose in the beginning. So this is the structure that it gives us. So this is the uh, profile of the branch decay scalar field. As you can see that in present era, that is Z close to zero, it almost takes uh, reaches a negligible value and it dominates the earlier epochs of cosmic expansion. The reverse is true for the Higgs-like scalar field, which starts uh, but starts taking a dominating role once the universe takes it in a cosmic acceleration around the respective one. And this interaction is quite interesting because it sort of mediates between these two scalar fields, the role of these two scalar fields. And this is the equation of state of the Higgs-like scalar field. We have vaguely called it the dark energy field, although it has not much of a case. And this is the effective equation of state of the system. How do you calculate it? Because you have no matter, you essentially take 3 h squared, that is the Freeman robertson walker field equation density term on the left hand side and take everything to the right hand side. So basically that gives you sort of a dense energy density of an effective fluid made up of whatever scalar field you have. And from the second Friedman equation, you write the effective pressure and you take a ratio. So this is the effective equation of state. And it is sensitive on the choice of branch decay parameter. So the larger value of branch decay parameter you take, as the rate curve suggests, the closer your theory is to standard. So that is the underlying take home note. And also, if you take the function mp to be constant instead of the function we have chosen, this curve does not really reach closer to minus one, it moves out. So actually, the theory itself encourages us to take the function of phi coefficient of phi square to the minus value function of phi. Okay, so this is what I have uh, essentially said that around present era, the branch decay scalar field is subdued compared to the scalar field that has a generalized derivative coupling with gravity. And the interaction between the two fields dominates the era of cosmic deceleration and falls off around the transition redshift. And interestingly, during late times, due to the dominance of the Higgs field, the structure of the theory effectively becomes that of a non minimally coupled scalar field theory which has derivative as well as non-derivative interaction. And during deceleration, the theory can effectively take the structure of a branch decay, standard branch decay theory, but with this cross interaction. Which also and uh, since you have the exact form of Hubble, 
you can also study these kind of things which i have not discussed here for the sake of brevity you can check the publications which i have mentioned earlier that it shows you a consistent growth of matter over density it also gives you a state of thermodynamic equilibrium and uh, the most important thing is that in a scenario where different kind of theory of gravity might be more suitable for different epochs of cosmic expansion so this is a very good example of a method of sewing them together into one common structure and substitute the unification you can call it that and of course the cross interaction can be imagined as a switch that controls different epochs so it is we have established that it is possible to realize a smooth transition of universe between different epochs even if you consider mild variation of the fundamental patterns the, the variation in in this case is described by by the cosmological higgs scalar field and it provides you some sort of observational consistency although plenty of work to be done but it is left for the that matter and the effective equation of state of the system is sensitive about the choice of transit parameter and the variation is entirely contained within the envisaged uh, dark energy scalar field or the higgs scalar field but has negligible trace on the effective equation of the state of the system so there remains a few interesting questions however and from where we can see a requirement of a better theory which supports a variation of fundamental constants first there has to be some link between this expected large value of branch decay parameter which still remains as you have just seen with this mild variation of fundamental constants and uh, having said that interestingly bjorken in early 2000s actually predicted that there perhaps is a link between parameters of fixed potential the gravitational coupling and the value of cosmological constant so it remains a field to be explored so why we needed better uh, require a better theory that it is a toy model a good toy model but it does not provide any lagrangian formulation from which you can actually derive the variation of the fundamental curve you just put in by hand the desired variation you need for your cosmological constant so it is a toy model at best and uh, having said that a new variation is already connected to the variation of fine structure constant on which we have a larger set of observation available from quasars and uh, we would like to mention the theory with varying fine structure constant of bekenstein and later later worked on by sandvik vera magui so so we will talk about a little bit about an extended version of bekenstein theory so how much time do i have okay so i will then skip the fundamental derivation part here so this is the very brief review of bekenstein's theory which was later generalized by sandvik baru magui uh this is the definition of fine structure you all know this alpha equal to e square by ch so if you have to say that alpha varies with space or time you have only two options you can't vary planck's constant you can either vary the speed of light or you can vary the electric charge okay so if you vary speed of light you are in lots of uh, many sorts of trouble because special relativity is awkward so uh, a less radical alternative is to consider that p varies and you give away the local charge conservation and write uh, probable theory of that so this is the underlying motivation so essentially you write the electric charge to be a scalar field or this e field and take psi a scalar field to be log of epsilon such that epsilon the e field is actually exponential of psi and the fine structure con constant variation is gone by e power 2 psi because it's a square and write the theory of gravity so the underlying point is that you write a theory where you introduce a scalar field which interacts with charge matter and by its interaction induces a variation on fine structure so this is the field equation of the theory uh, the standard theory and this is actually the equation of variation of the fine structure constant p the fine structure coupling p which is the psi field so the physical idea which was later promoted by baro working on bekenstein's original theory that whatever cold dark matter we have in our universe 
it has magnetic fields and electric fields. That much is clear. And so the magnetic fields dominate the electric fields and the magnetostatic energy in that process drives the change in alpha in matter dominated it. That is during this period. And as the universe starts to accelerate, this change becomes friction dominant. And essentially, he contained all this information within this parameterization, where he introduced the parameter zeta and written, uh, written it as a ratio in em divided by rho. So rho is the total baryon energy density. And this ratio is essentially the fraction of non-relativistic matter in our universe, uh, which contributes to it. So the calculation of Barrow says that, uh, I'm leaving those discussions apart. So it essentially uh, pinpoints the value of this parameter to be within minus one and one. So we will work with two choices of zeta in all our calculations, one in the negative one in the To be diplomatic in fact, no predominant <laughs> choices whatsoever. And the other fluid contents of the universe are self-conserved. And uh, I'm repeating the cosmic evolution of fine structure constant is given by the e to the power two psi into the dimension of e square by h but e to the square by h plus. Okay, so this is the um, list of quasar absorption spectra we have used. We actually have more observation derivatives for fine structure variations than a proton to electron mass ratio. And what is the generalization in this? What we have introduced a generalization which accommodates the variation of Newtonian coupling as well as the fine structure. So it is a little bit artificial in that only one fundamental coupling of, of coupling of our universe can vary. So it is more natural to think, uh, think that all of the fundamental couplings should vary, but we don't actually have the setup to write all fundamental couplings in one in one go. So we have to do it one one coupling at a time. So this is the branch decay part. This phi governs the variation of the gravitational coupling. And here, this L contains matter distribution and the varying fine structure constant, that is the charge matter distribution. So effectively, the variation of, under, uh, variation of fine structure coupling is included in the theory of gravity as an effective matter. So these are the plots of the solution. I'm going straight to it. Okay. So this is the variation of psi. That is oh, right. psi, which is the E field that governs the variation of the fine structure coupling. And uh, from that, you can actually calculate the variation of fine structure coupling itself as a function of redshift. As you can, actually, you can see that the variation is very mild. I will show you a plot in a couple of slides that show, show you how mild the variation is. And this is the delta alpha by alpha plotted against the observational data points. And this is the solution of branch decay scalar fields, which gives you two possible solutions and uh, for two initial conditions. The left one being d phi dz at rate equal to zero greater than zero, and the other one is negative. And this is omega branch decay which is taken as a function of coordinate in this case, as a function of which. So these are all the unknown quantities solved as a function. So what, they, what do they actually mean? So before that, this is, these are the plots for zeta greater than zero, and these are the plots for zeta less than zero. And you can see that there are no, no speakable difference between the two choices of initial conditions in this case. So what does it mean? The first is that the in here, the variation of fine structure coupling is derived from a dynamical equation and not enforced at the outset, which was the first motivation to write this thing. The variation is quite mild and fits in nicely with spectroscopic analysis of molecular absorption lines. The third one is very important because the generalized branch decay parameter, originally the constant branch decay parameter has a huge cons constraints, uh, steep constraint from observational evidences. We actually move a little bit towards solving it by taking it as a function of phi. It behaves differently in different epochs of cosmic expansion. During late times, it actually approaches a very high value, which is comparable to the recent estimates of Cassini growth, which measures the constants on it. And during the preceding deceleration, it has a comparatively smaller non-zero value. What does the Cassini growth measure? Uh, the 
कॉन्स्टेंट्स ऑन ओमेगा ब्रांच जी द ब्रांच जी के पैटर्न ओके ओके and uh, the branch decay field uh, phi uh, it depends on the signature of one initial condition which i have already shown that by nature these two different kinds of solutions leads to two different kinds of things how it is more clear if you plot the effective gravitational coupling as a function of hub so it essentially points out to two very different theories for the left hand side plot it is for defi dz at z equal to 0 greater than 0 The effective gravitational coupling decays smoothly with hub, which means that gravitational interaction was weaker in the past, and the maximum allowed value of effective coupling is one, which is scaled in that manner for the sake of our calculations. So this version of the theory can be compared to asymptotically free theory in standard. But if G G effective decays with hub, that is increases with cosmic expansion. Remember that A equal to zero by A. There is always a conflict with the present Hubble tension on the. So in that sense, this version of the theory is quite problematic. So you can actually avoid this by choosing the second initial condition, where G effective increases with Hubble, which means that the, uh, it decays with cosmic time until a minimum allowed value of the G effective is reached. This avoids the Hubble tension, but at the expense of giving away this asymptotically free nature of standard. Okay, so this is actually the comparison of variations. Delta G by G actually varies roughly four five order of magnitude greater than the variation of alpha. As you can see, the scale of variation is some ten to the power minus six. Okay, so before concluding, let me show you something very interesting. You can actually manipulate the field equations of this version of the theory and write the field equations as alpha equations as a function of G because both of them are scalar. And by solving that numerical for different initial conditions, you always get this kind of plots. Alpha is a function of G. So how one fundamental coupling varies as a function of R. So by some trial and error, we have actually found the functional form which can agree with this kind of uh, profile, where this alpha zero is the present value of the fine structure coupling, which is close to zero point zero zero seven, which you can check on Google. G zero by G is dimensionless, uh, where G zero is the present value of the coupling, which is scaled to be one. You can scale it to be something other. And epsilon is a parameter which is plus minus one, which actually indicates two version of the theory. One is the asymptotically free theory, one is not asymptotically free theory. And for the two versions, these are the estimated parameters which satisfies the plots. You can fit in this profile with the plots. So what does this function mean? I am looking to find. I am looking for other motivations, and so this we can infer from this kind of plots and functional forms. The two endpoints of the plot, you can take this as a reference. This actually shows the functional form far better than the other three of the plot. Give two maximum allowed values of alpha. It also coincides with the two accelerations of the universe, where g is either zero or g is either one. So essentially, it means that universe moves back into recent acceleration with alpha approaching the second maxima and begins with the alpha's first maxima. So, in retrospective, does our universe accelerate when the fundamental coupling senses some sort of an extreme? That is the question. So it is not answered in here. So what are my future scopes and challenges? So the first question I have also mentioned that does the accelerated field of universe always coincide with extreme of one or more of the fundamental couplings? Or does it continue to follow this pattern because we have worked as a function of z, which is loop back time. So we are talking about something that happened over past. What about the future? So for that we will require a dynamical system analysis perhaps to do some fixed point analysis of the you know, differential equations. We of course needs a better parameterization of this barrow parameter. Where he did just hand pick this zeta equal to L m by rho, which covers the nature of cold dark matter distribution, and, and of course, what is cold dark matter distribution? And does it leave any signature in the gravitational wave observation or any other sensitive observation during the present time? So, as I was saying, that a radical alternative will be to consider a varying speed of light theory, which has already been 
consider in some length, but to no good end, because essentially it breaks down load as independence. So quite recently, which this this can be a uh, plausible direction. It may have some connection with mass variation of deep tissue, but more on that in perhaps. So I will stop here. The exact time of the linear pass from where this activation has to involve the pressure equals not exactly, but you can actually constrain it between somewhere before z equal to 1. So the deceleration transforms itself uh, from a positive to negative domain at some point on the redshift axis where it crosses. So that point should be less than 1, the transition less than 1. So how exactly do you go to that? How exactly do you reach that? OK. So for that, you need to actually do. Because you know the value of lambda. Yes. Because you know lambda, right? And so you know the you know the omega lambda, you know omega. You know at what point of time the lambda? You know how to get, but then you can figure out. So in a, another way of answering it, if, if it does not. Transform itself from different to say someplace, let's say z greater than one, you would not be able to match the Hubble distance. So, this is the end result you will get. Interesting question, but the answer I don't completely know. But this scale of variation is actually uh, referred to be coming coming from galaxy clustering experiments, where they say that actually the G variation. What exactly is the G variation? They do not know either. But it should be roughly of the order of five six order of magnitude greater than variation of alpha or proton to mass, electron mass, mass ratio. So these people, I think, have referred. They actually do this kind of. Something bug, don't I? It was actually in the big book. These papers. King, Dapra, yes, this Dapra paper. They actually work on this kind of thing. Because right now, people do not, let's say, one doesn't assume any variation. Hmm. And then do the normal, what kind of clustering will happen. And that hmm. matches somewhat with us. Hmm. So that's why people do inverse because it right. matches. But then, if now, if there is really variation, then what kind of changes that will uh, cause in clustering, for example? That's probably so in general, I can say this, that uh, in standard GR, or straightforward modifications of gravity, somehow we have a dark energy scalar. 
with or without observation detection and we are showing that. But in this kind of model, there is actually no dark energy scalar field. Somehow the particle physics motivated fields are doing the job. So that is a huge difference. So in some way, these uh, parameters of the Higgs potential, let's say, or the parameters of this uh, fine structure evolution, they will come to somehow uh, conspire among themselves to drive these things. It could be a possibility. Yes, in this version it does. So, can't you do that by measuring it I don't know what in what scale we can measure in laboratory. That is the question. We can measure in the past that much accurate. I guess the laboratory probably they can do because uh, you can you also see that I have excluded all the uh, data from redshift zero to one because they are too erratic. I will not be able to contain within this scale of the graph. That is why. So the people who do this kind of observation, they actually say that redshift one onwards data are good. Correct. Right. Because cosmological yeah. things you have measured. Right. But here you can measure lab. So that is, I don't know, lab measurement is the alpha value. That is your alpha zero. Right. But we need, can it be detected somewhere around the earth? So that alpha um, zero, that Calculate. Mm -hmm. That is alpha zero measured in lab only. Right. So the things that uh, you know, you should have alpha zero zero. Uh, I see. Okay. Okay. But it it actually isn't the number of data points I have seen. That is a, cosmological. Cosmological. I, I know that. that. Data, data right. The present value, point zero zero seven. You can actually perhaps have an idea from this expression itself. So when I have written alpha as a function of g, alpha zero is outside, which is the present value. Right. So whatever variation it starts at some value of g, which was relevant somewhere in the past. So in, it, it means that at this present point, alpha is alpha. As but your graph is not showing like that. It is at zero. It is uh, no, but uh, yeah. Go back to the graph. Graph is showing that delta alpha by alpha is high, which not means zero. Delta alpha by alpha is zero. Uh, but, but it asymptotically reaches the present value, which is point zero zero somewhere seven so two. Yes, yes. That is delta alpha by alpha. Right, you are saying that there should be no variation in present. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. 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 We have a solution which starts from here. That actually solves your question, which can yeah, be a, a special case of the solution. Right. I'm not sure because uh, if you consider Bekenstein's old paper, it was his prediction that 
there has to be some kind of a face transmission in dark matter. How he says it, I don't know. From where it comes with being magnetostatic energy, which drives the evolution, to the friction dominated, which drives the evolution. So I guess it, this redshift somehow indicates that it will be guesswork. In the beginning, when you were maintaining your physical things, you were just using the understanding of physics. How do you keep teaching the concept? What do you mean? Have you seen the concept? The first model, right? Yeah, in the past. Okay, these are the equations. What it is actually in the constraint on the uh, pi? You know, it actually puts a dimensional constraint. I mean, uh, if you put a simple scalar field in Einstein theory, which has, let's say, an interaction of the form of its potential, then that Inner field has to be canonical dimension one. We are working with flat cost, especially flat cost. That was uh, taken as a piece. Right. That is going to constraint. So we we are basically saying that we have a flat cosmology, which is not exactly Einstein, which is Banzi, because here the geodesic equations are different. Then what is that constraint? There are three parameters. When you're not going Look, the constraints comes from three things, mathematically speaking. One is choosing the action in this branch because the branch bigger parameter and the geometric coupling base donor those come into play. Two, the power law solution answer. The power law solution will give me some kind of again kind of thing. And third is the interaction between the two scalar So I'm not sure if I directly answered the question. So, we have a question? Okay, so it's not actually, uh, when you go back to the action, there is uh, the, 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 the extended one or the normal one? Normal one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, my question is that, okay, here and also, I mean, we can use it to the extended one also. That whenever I choose uh, more than one scalar uh, uh, is how do we keep the scale? Because, uh, scale apart from scale of the scalar. Okay. 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 And uh, next is uh, for the phi field. Actually, uh, there are no self interaction of the phi field. Yes. Terms, uh, of the phi field, there is V phi. P5 is self-interaction and mm -hmm. that is have chosen like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the and as you showed that the I mean the couplings in uh, the V5 that you are constantly from the, the cosmological uh, what about uh, the other one side? Because that should also have a mass on Does it? Because this is a geometric scalar. If you, whether or not you put 
he chose to put in uh, self interaction potential of a branch like killer field it's a choice it was ordinarily a geometric newtonian coupling scalar field should not have an interaction actually why i, I cannot answer no, either I because Essentially, um, most of the models, modified models of branch decay theory, where a self interaction of the branch decay scalar field is chosen, they actually suffer from this some cosmological epoch problem, which actually eludes me right now. The actual actual problem, what is, it is actually disfavored because of the uh, cosmological requirements. <laughs> The kind of interaction that we can do from the interaction. The branch decay scalar field actually is massless. Is it, is it not? Because it, it never has. Yes, it is. Uh, if you erase all these terms, let's say, from here to here, this is the standard branch decay field. So it actually is a massless geometric scalar field. And for the side field, okay. And I'm just extended one, what mm -hmm. we see that it is the interaction potential. Right? The, the interaction is the, being generalized, yes. So in this case, as you were you, you were saying that the dimensional uh, requirements, that all the terms is canonical dimension four, because so uh, phi is canonical dimension one, psi is two. So this is the cross interaction. So if phi is one, psi is two, this is four. And uh, this u phi psi are generalized in the later case, it actually is in the publication that you can actually have four to four or five different sets for that, which satisfies the dimensional requirements and still goes on describing the standard possibility. Yes, yeah. No motivation whatsoever. Just to match with this. I mean, it's a radical choice, you can say. Because by no way, no way this mass profile is signing, sir. It is not possible. Uh, but just on paper, if you see these points, it comes to mind that it has some sort of an oscillatory. So that is why this is one of the reasons we required a better cube. This is actually not a very good cube. Just the so just the AB is very number of parameters five. Exactly. Okay, another question that ten to the power minus is two is two at the twenty one, the error bars are included and the other for ten is the error bars are not. That's it. That's it. Error bars are huge actually in Specifically, proton electron mass, that, that's why it is better to work with fine structures. Because as you say, the theory is called like the functional theory. To me, it looks like they are all. It can, that is why I have said that we do not claim this to be the only possible. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Uh, 10 to the minus 16. Uh, okay. This one? Yes. So, uh, this found, I mean, this minus 60. Uh, this is observed. This is observed. This is observed variation. The present variation of delta mu by mu as it is measured, measured by this. I shouldn't say present because it is in a paper of 2017. The observed bound is this. It will be minus 16 per year. So, Observation is the optical atomic clocks. They essentially analyze the cesium atomic spectra from quasars. And basically, the idea, as much as I understand, is that if there is some more, um, some departure from standard model of particle physics and uh, some departure from the standard theory, in the observation, the optical clock will speed up or slow down. So basically, they calculate that and back to uh, calculate this. Constant on delta mu by mu. 
I think this I mean, this is Different quizzes, different microscopes. Yeah, that's Probe is measuring the local astronomical tastes. It actually measures two things. One is the constant on this branch delay parameter, and second is this free force constant. I may, uh, may mentioned in the introduction. Uh, I just wanted to think of how Cassini is the, the, this probe that's going to be Saturn. Yes, that so, is how uh, I do not know. But it, it, it may have some connection with this free fall tastes because. Uh, in free force observations, and they essentially ruled essentially rule out the coincidence based on this because you, if you drop two things, one on moon and one on in a laboratory, let's say in a similar environment, the default time there is a calculation of parameter is there by comparing. Okay, given some constraints. So constraints on modified theories. Yes, that is why I mentioned that there should be some signatures there of yes. this, this kind of variations. One can also expect changes in uh, this memory effect, this right. kind of things, yes. So when gravity wave passes through one kind of medium, it remains, it leaves it permanently, what should I say, TDT, that sort of. So if your theory is different, it's not standard here, the field will be different. Do you have any opinion on this octonionic theory that can derive find such a constant from that? <laughs> no, I don't know enough to have an opinion. I'm trying. Okay. Okay. So thank you again, Shomo. In the next one, Nisha. In the next one, Nisha.